PowerShell is, is one of those things where it's really, really easy to get into. Kind of once you get over a little bit of a hurdle and you understand what the commands look like and how the help system works. Like there's a couple of things you have to know. And then once you're into it, it's pretty straightforward. And for better or for worse, when the team designed it, they kind of designed it to provide an entry ramp for several different audiences. And this, this was a good idea in that it got people into PowerShell quickly and a bad idea in that it got them into the dark, hidden, dusty, nasty, musty corners of PowerShell sometimes. So you could approach PowerShell a lot like you approached VBScript. You could treat it a lot like you would treat a batch file. Or you could go at it like you would go at a C-sharp program. Those are sadly all wrong. You can do it, but you will get yourself down a path where you start fighting the shell because you, you get to a point where it says, yeah, except I'm not really VBScript and I really want you to do it this way. And it turns out you should have been doing it this way all along and your life would have been better. So that's what this session is really all about. It's taking that, that command that you figured out in the console on the command line and turning that into a reusable tool that fits PowerShell's native patterns and practices. So we're not going to be fighting the shell. Now for a lot of people, this means unlearning some things, and that's fine, that's what we're here to do. Uh, for some people, it means, oh, I didn't realize that's why you never do it that way, and that's great, that's what we're here for. So make sure you're asking those questions. Why'd you do it that way? I'm going to post all my code. I'm going to post it on donjones.com. It'll be there forever. So those of you with computers, do not spend your time here trying to copy my code. You will not be able to keep up with me. I type very fast and I type while I talk. I want you to be looking at the code on the screen and I want you to know why it's up there. And if you don't know why it's up there, ask because that's the important part, okay? All on the same page there? All right, so I mean, let's just start with something really, really simple over here on the shell. Um, what we do with the tool that I'm going to build today is not as important as how I do it, right? It's, it's about the tool making that's the important bit, not necessarily what the tool does. So I want to keep the actual task we're performing a little bit simple for two reasons. One, I don't want to get caught up on that task. Two, I want it to take up very little screen space because I have to jack my font size all the way up so that you can read it. So the less, the less code I have, the more I can fit on the screen. So let's just do something simple with a sim. Get sim instance. Uh, let's do this from a remote computer, DC. Can you guys read that? Okay, except for the, the dark gray. It's a terrible color choice. Uh, let's do Win32 operating system. That's a fun one. Uh, you do have to spell it right. That's important. It doesn't want to tab complete today. System. Uh, let's just that. Okay, that didn't work. Let's see why. <laughs> it looks just like black text, though. Nice. Uh, I'll show you my fun little trick for that in a sec. Is my network hooked up? No, no it's not, that's why. Uh, set Don VM. Come on, you can do it. No, apparently you can't. Well, here, two things. First of all, error foreground color equals green. There. Plus it feels nicer, doesn't it? Like that's life affirming. Uh, all right, let's just do something local then real quick. Okay, what's the computer name here? That is why, I think I'm in the wrong VM. I wonder how many of these I have. Do, 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 do. Windows 10. Yeah, that's the one we're running. Oh, you know why? Let's do it in Windows 8. <coughs> this will work. Get sim, get sim instance, computer name DC, class Win32, operating system. There we go, okay. So this works. Is that still legible in the back of the room? Yes. Font is sufficiently. All right, let's get the, 
Now, I'm going to use the ISE here. I don't really care if that's what you prefer or don't prefer. Um, I'm not going to suggest the ISE is perfect, but in a lot of situations it's good enough. And I use it because it's what everybody has. And my goodness, that's tiny. There we go. Everybody at least has this. Um, I don't know if you've seen, there's a, a, a new enhanced ISE that's out in kind of preview mode. You should take a look at that. Um, that'd be something great to talk to the team about. They'll probably want to hear what you think of it. Um, you know, Visual Studio Code has got support for PowerShell now. You can use that. Sapien's got editors out there. You can use that if you want to. I'm going to use this because it's relatively uncluttered. Let me get that a little smaller. So I almost always, when I begin the tool making process, I almost always start in the console. And here's a key thing, and I'll, I'll, I'll get into the why behind this a little bit more. I never start in the console pane of the ISE. The ISE works differently than the console. It maintains its memory and scoping differently from the console, and there's a reason for that. It is a development environment. You should not regard it as a test environment. You will get different results. So I always start in the console. That's my lowest common denominator, and I always get my command running there first. So let's just uh, let's do one more command. Let's get a different uh, class here, computer system. Okay, that worked. Once I know everything works, I'll go ahead and copy and paste it into a new script. Uh, single pane. Computer system. Okay. What about the, th this is a script right now. This is officially a, a tool. I could give this to somebody else and they could run my script and it would automate those tasks. There are, are, there's one thing wrong with this as a tool and there's one thing that's suboptimal about it. Let's start with the suboptimal bit. What, what here is not optimal? I've got the hard coded computer name. So, I mean, I could just give this to the help desk and say, look, if you want to use this, just open it up in Notepad and change the computer name. I mean, don't change where it says computer name, but change, mm, yeah, I can already see this going badly. The other thing that this does wrong, and this is a hugely important concept that's going to drive a lot of what we talk about. This is emitting two different types of objects to a single pipeline. When I ran this over here in the console, I got two separate pipelines. I ran the first command, I hit enter, that's a pipeline, and it produced its output. I typed the second command, I hit enter, it ran it into a second separate new fresh pipeline, emitted its output, and that's what I got on the screen. When I run my script, if I were to type my script name and hit enter, I get one pipeline. And everything that script emits goes to that one pipeline. PowerShell does not work as well by default when you've got multiple different things in the pipeline. In fact, on a routine basis, you probably only run one command that deliberately puts two different types of objects into the pipeline. T tell me what that is. Get child item. Dir, get child item. Because it produces file and folder objects, right? And it produces a pretty good looking display, doesn't it? I mean, it's it's perfectly legible. Do you want to know why? Do you want to know what Microsoft had to do to make those two objects actually work? Look at this nonsense. Uh, let's cd ps home. And we've got all these XML files in here. There we go. Notepad file system. They had to do this. All this XML exists solely to make sure your directory listings look good when there are two different objects in the pipeline. You are not going to be doing that every single time you write a tool or a script. So you need to limit yourself to one kind of output in the pipeline. That is important. And that often involves significantly rethinking the way you approach your command. So when you sit down to begin with, you have to be thinking, what is the one kind of object I'm going to want out of this that will serve all my needs? only one. So let's start by getting rid of that hard-coded computer name. We'll add a parameter block to the top of our script, declare a parameter called string, that is a string called computer name, and we will use that 
in place of the hard-coded So we've taken care of this, the suboptimal bit now. We have a, a parameterized thing. Why did I use dollar sign computer name? Why didn't I put host or machine? Because host is already by variable. Variable. At the end of the day, every other PowerShell command that accepts a computer name does so on a minus computer name parameter. Our goal is to be consistent with the rest of the shell. When I sit down and look at a command and I want to see if it supports other computers, I look for a minus computer name parameter. Be consistent. Don't invent new crap. The whole thing that was a problem with the old command.exe shell is that every single command had a brand new set of parameters you had to learn. How many of you have ever run iCackles without looking up the syntax in an example first? <laughs> right? Because there's like 82 different cackles. So there's cackles, there's decackles, there's ds cackles, there's i cackles, there's x cackles, and they all have different parameters. Well, the whole point of PowerShell was to try and fix that with consistency. So stay consistent. Be consistent. Uh, so now that we've got that in there, let's take care of the other bit. Uh, who thinks we should be accepting more than one computer name? Sure. Let's do that too. There. Now it accepts more than one computer name. Now we have to start thinking really carefully about how we want this to work because we've got a couple of potential things going on. This will work perfectly if I run it as is. It's wrong, but it'll work. Let's say I run this with three computer names. What's going to happen? What's the output going to look like? It's going to be three of line six and then three of line seven. It's going to be three operating system objects and then three computer system objects. That's probably not optimal. That's probably not what we want. Another problem, what if the second computer name I give it isn't there? It won't actually terminate. PowerShell commands hate to terminate. They will go to great lengths to just chug through and keep on going. So we're going to get an error message in the middle of all of our output. And the thing is, because I'm just giving each of these two commands, a whole block of computer names, I don't actually have any way of knowing which one failed. Like in, in my code, I don't get to see which one failed. So here's what we're going to do instead. We're going to do a little for each loop. And I am immediately going to go indent the code that lives inside of this thing because people who do not format their code correctly are bad people. I'm not saying they're as bad as like a pedophile, but it's really close. How did you get it from line six to jump down to line eight the way you did? How did I get it to do line eight? I went to the end of line seven and hit enter. Yeah, yeah, I'm 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 quick like a bunny. I got to fix one thing real quick because I I I'm enumerating my computer names, but I got to fix that right here. If you guys distract me, I have not had enough coffee to catch that. Go ahead. Yeah, so the short version of that is um, why don't I just only accept a single computer name and pipe computer names to it? We're going to get there too, but if you look at the patterns that PowerShell itself follows, it often allows both. Meaning, um, I can do a get child item on a single directory, but I can also do it on multiple directories at the same time. So I'm trying to stick with the patterns that the shell supports because, and, and this is the reason the shell does that. I can't predict how some Yahoo later on is going to need to use this. And I don't want to predict. I want to create as much flexibility in here as I can so that I don't need to go back later and make some changes. This might be the first thing in the pipeline at some point. Yeah, I just want to say, yeah, based on that, this way will allow you to do tool name, dash, computer name, parenthesis, get AD computer, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, there's... And then piping it in there, you can use it on that side. Yeah, there's a, lot, there's a lot more patterns. And once we get this to a point where we can run it, there's a lot more patterns I can use to input those computer names. Because sometimes the output of another command is not going to be suitable for this. 
So there's other things I can do to, to use that anyway. So it's just a broader set of patterns we can support. Okay, so we've got this. This is now going to go through each computer name one at a time and query both objects. We're still outputting two objects. That's still wrong. So to prevent the computer from outputting those, we're going to capture the output to a variable. So now both of those objects are being captured to a variable. They're not going to the pipeline. If I ran the script right now, what would my output be? Nothing. Nothing. So There's a major version. What else do we want on here? Um, OS version. Want that? OS version. Ver verb version. Um, OS name. Nah, nobody cares about the OS name. Microsoft doesn't even know what the OS names are. Um, <laughs> model. Let's do that. CS model. Um, MFGR is CS manufacturer. Oh, thank God for tab completion. That's enough for right now. New object, type name, PS object, property, properties. So I've created a new object from scratch. I have populated it with a combination of information from my two bits of SIM data that I retrieved. I am actually, and this will make a lot more sense later, I am going to save this to a variable as well, and then immediately output it. Um, I do this for two reasons. One, there are a lot of situations where before you output that new object, you want to do things to it first. And so this is a pattern that lets me stick more code in between those. And the other, and this is a, this is a really important code maintainability point. I don't like to implicitly write things to the pipeline. I like to explicitly do it so that I can come in here and quickly put my eyeballs on the exact spot where my output is being produced by looking for the command write output. Whereas if I just did a new object, it's implicitly outputting that. I like to be a lot more explicit. Notice I do not use the return keyword. How many have used the return keyword? Stop it. It's only there to fool you. Microsoft, it, there are people on the team who significantly regret having done that. They call it syntax sugar, and they only put it there because developers were going to look for it because they were used to it, but it doesn't do what it should do. Now, that's different when you get into classes in version 5, but we're not there. We're writing a, a, a script, not a class. Don't use the return keyword. It doesn't do what you think. And all you're doing is creating a maintainability problem for somebody else later on down the line. Yeah, so when I, in, instead of using the PS object type accelerator, yeah, there's about four different ways I could have arrived at that new object. Um, I almost, just as a personal preference, and this isn't right or wrong, I almost always take the most explicit route to get anywhere. Um, a lot of developers, especially C Sharp guys who are used to casting an object with that square bracket syntax, will use the PS object type accelerator, and that's fine. Um, the big difference is that my version will work in older versions of PowerShell than yours. So, and I, again, I tend to have a habit toward long form. So does this just say basically, hey, PowerShell cast this to whatever you think it is? Does this basically just say PowerShell cast this to whatever you think it is? Uh, no, this is just a hash table. And this is explicitly creating a PS object type of object and then giving it properties that correspond with my hash table. So I will have a computer name property, an SP version property. So there's no casting going on. PS object is just a, a, a blank object that has a couple of things wired up to it already that is for this exact purpose. This is why it, it exists. Yeah? Is there an advantage to PS object over the old PS custom object type? Um, there is no difference between PS object and the old PS custom object. This is just shorter. That's all. They did it for brevity. 
Uh, it aligns well with the PS object type accelerator syntactically. So if you're used to one, this tends to make sense. Good questions. So obviously I could stack as much into that property hash table as I want to. There's another whole technique where you create a blank PS object and then use the add member command to repeatedly add members to it. That just gets really lengthy. This is a lot more, I think, concise. Uh, and it's easier to put your eyeballs all on the data in one spot. Is there ever a time you would want to do it? Too, What's that? This is faster if you're in a loop, too. Yeah, this is, this is moderately faster. Um, you, you know, when you talk about PowerShell and speed, you got to remember that it isn't fast, period. And so the, the degrees of slowness are what you're, you're battling. Um, this is a couple degrees less slow than the other way, yeah. Is there ever a time you would want to use? Is there a time when you would want to use add member? Yeah, um, add member is really useful if you're getting an object out of another command already and you want to tack a couple of things onto it. Meaning you're not creating it from whole cloth, it's being given to you and you want to add a couple bits. So as an example, I could have taken my operating system object and run it through add member a couple of times to just add model and manufacturer and then I would have the whole operating system object plus a couple extra things. So yeah, you might do that. Um, but the add member is, is really lengthy. Keep, keep in mind too that I hate people who in a script don't type out all their parameter names completely. Right? Bad people, nearly as bad as the people who don't format their code, which is nearly as bad as pedophiles. Right? So that's the, the stack rank. Um, and so with the add member, because you have to use all three parameters and the parameter names are very long, the thing stretches off the side of the screen uh, and makes for a bad presentation. So. That's kind of like my key thing. Can I fit it all on the screen at once? So at this point, we have a pretty functional little piece of hunk going on. Let's save it. Your spacing is inconsistent on the computer variable. No, it's not. <laughs> Don't be like that. Get OS info one. Um, I would normally never put, so if, if you look at that script name real quick, I would normally never add the one. We're just doing that because we're going to have several iterations of this here in class and I want to save them separately. That's all, all the reason. What are you talking about with my spacing? The casing. The casing. casing. Oh, I don't care about that. Almost as bad as the people. No, it's not. <laughs> PowerShell is case insensitive and so am I. So a lot of people tell me I'm just generally insensitive, but whatever. Screw those people. All right. Uh, get uh, get dash os tab to complete. This is still a script, so I have to make sure I'm providing a path, right? PowerShell won't run a script without a path, so we're just going to do this. And I got nothing because I didn't give it a computer name. Win eight one. Oops. There we go. Two different computers, two different objects come out. PowerShell has displayed these in a list form for me. That was its default decision. Do you know why? Because it only has, because it has five. Anything more than four is a list. Four or less defaults to a table. That's all that is. We can get into customizing that later if you want to. Um, however, two things to, to note at this point. One, one thing I see people do wrong a lot. This really frustrates me, so don't do it. Um, up here at the top, they'll do, you know, like an out variable, and they'll set it to an empty array, and then down here, They'll append their new object to that array, and then at the very bottom, they'll output the entire array. The net result of that looks the same, and so it's very difficult to understand that you are breaking gravity, and people are going to fall off the planet. Because that breaks the pipeline, right? Because when I run this in the pipeline, I have now created a blocking command. Normally, the pipeline does a pseudo multi-threaded kind of thing where one object at a time is flying through different commands and there's other objects behind it. And so all the commands can run kind of in parallel. There is a time and a place to do this technique. For example, the sort object command does this internally. It has to because it can't sort everything until it has everything. But unless that's the type of command you're writing, don't do this. This is something that a lot of folks who are, again, programmers, are accustomed to having to manage their own output stream. You don't have to do that here because PowerShell does it for you. So just write it to the pipeline. 
write it to the pipeline, and let the shell do its thing. Hand it off and walk away. Okay, that's an important piece here. Uh, we do not have any kind of error handling in this. This might be a good thing to go ahead and add at this time. So where might I expect an error to occur? Just shout it out. Line six or seven, probably. Yeah. So I, I kind of have a little bit of a, a, an inefficiency going on here that I'd, I'd like to kind of correct at the same time. In fact, before we get to the error handling, let's maybe talk about the inefficiency here because we, we want to build tools that work well. Can you see anything here that's maybe suboptimal in terms of how it's using the computer resources? You're connecting twice. I'm connecting twice. There is a, a, a perhaps trivial but greater than zero amount of overhead involved in setting up that SIM connection and then tearing it down and then setting it up again and then tearing it down again. So rather than doing that, I think what I would like to do set up a session oops er, new sim instance why doesn't it want to complete my session oh yeah it thinks I'm stuck let's get rid of both of these is it sim or mm, all right I've been dealing with a new version too much and they made some changes in one of the betas. So let's just help at this real quick. Help, stop, stop, stop. Help, get sim instance. I can't remember if it's a right, dash sim session. That's what I'm after. So sim session, session, right? Sim session, session, session. It's tab completion is a little afraid. Now that I've made that change, where can I expect my error to occur? Six. Line six. Is it safe to say that if line six works, line seven and eight will also work? Assuming I've tested them and they don't have a typo or something, right? There's a difference between a typo. I'll get into arguments with people. Well, I just want to wrap the whole thing in a try catch in case there's a typo. No, fix the typo, right? You actually want to see that error message. Don't just shut off all the errors because some of them are your fault. Um, as scary as they are with the red text, change it to green, right? That's why we do that. So I'm going to wrap. I'm going to put a try here. Where is the sensible place for my try block to end? It is not after line seven. It is actually all the way down here. Because if line seven fails, I don't want anything else to happen. If seven fails, I can't do eight, I can't do nine, and if I don't do eight and nine, then there's no damn point in doing 10, 11, 12, 13, or any of the rest of it. So if I get an error on seven, I want to abandon ship and go do something different. So that's why it's structured that way. Yes? So why don't I just terminate the pro I don't want to terminate the process. Well, I mean, just that iteration of the for each or the throw. I'll throw you'll, you'll, error, but it'll do your next iteration. You'll see why. I'll show you. We're going to handle the error rather than just barfing it. Sometimes that's the right approach. Sometimes when an error occurs, but keep in mind that when you throw within a scope, you're not going to throw yourself to the next iteration of a for each. You're going to toss yourself out of this scope. You're going to, the script is going to end. And I don't want that to happen. I want to keep going. What about nested try-catch um, There is a time and a place for nested, right? If you think, for example, that you know line seven here might fail for some reason and line nine might have a totally different failure that you need to handle, then yeah, you would have a more specific nested one around that. And that would be fine if you've got a way to handle that separately. So there's one thing I'm missing on line seven to make this all work. What is it? Error action, thank you. Error action, stop. Because normally the shell is going to try and keep on going. 
it would run line seven. If there was a failure, it would say, hey, there was a failure. I'll get an error message, but I will not get a trappable exception. And there is a difference between an error message printed on the screen and a trappable exception that I can catch in my code. Stop forces it to do a trappable exception that I can then catch. That is also why we had to enumerate the computer names and only do one computer at a time. So that if it breaks, I can still loop back up and do the next computer. So here's what I'm gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna walk into something here. This is not the cleanest code yet, but we're, we're doing this for illustra illustrative purposes. If I fail to connect to a computer, I am still going to output the exact same kind of object. I'm just going to null out its properties. Now there's actually a slightly better way that I, I prefer that I tend to use in production, which is this. This means I can take the output of my command and I can sort or filter for the computers that were successful or not successful. So do you still need to put, do you need to be explicit and put those, at, set those as null? Um, you don't, well, you got to set them to something because you want them to be there, right? We want one type of thing going to the pipeline. What I don't want is sometimes the object has these properties and sometimes it doesn't have the properties. It needs to have the properties and they have to be set to something. You could set them to an empty string, except on the top half, things like SP version aren't a string, they're an integer. So you could set it to zero, but that doesn't actually, zero might be a valid value and you don't have a valid value here, you have nothing. And that's why I tend to do null. It's more the semantics, the meaning of it, than the actual syntax of what you type. I've got some wasted code here. There is no reason, this is identical code. There's no reason for it to exist twice. So I'm gonna delete it here. I'm gonna delete it here. And I'm gonna put a finally. Finally will run after try if there was no error, or it will run after catch if there was an error. It also runs if you hit control C. It also runs if you break out. We're not worried about that right now. Don't hit control C. Why don't you do a test connection? Why don't I do a test connection? Uh, a couple of reasons. Test connection is just a ping. Just because I can ping a computer does not mean I can connect to its SIM service and vice versa. Just because a ping fails, Maybe the firewall is blocking ICMP, but it's going to allow SIM. So because I don't have a working test SIM session, all it would do is what I'm doing here. I'm doing this. This also fails faster than a failed ping. And even if, let's say, uh, let's say there's a situation where a computer accepts the ping, so that passes. And let's say I did have a way of just testing to see if the SIM port was open, right? 5985 or 5986 by default. That still doesn't tell me that I'm going to be able to authenticate, that I'm going to have permission to query. So this kind of rolls the whole thing up into one failure, ideally. Good questions. Notice that I am not. Here's something else I see folks do that really, really troubles me. I'm not merely querying and then testing to see if I got a null object back, right? You'll see folks say, get sim instance, blah, 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 minus error action silently continue. Oh. And then their next line will be, if OS is null, then I know I didn't get anything. Don't do that. That's terrible. There are times when a command is working perfectly and legitimately returns a null value. For example, get sim instance 
minus computer name, whatever, minus class name, Win32 tape drive. How many of your servers still have a tape drive? What would you expect to, what is a tape drive? Did she just ask that? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, now I don't feel old. <sighs> what would you expect to get back from that query? Normally, nothing. You're not gonna get an error because it is legitimately returning null. So it's fine to check for a null result as an expected result, right? If we didn't have a tape drive, then I'll skip this section of code, that's fine. But don't use checking for a null result as a method of error handling. See the difference? In that case, the null result was not the result of an error. It was a result of a perfectly normal non-error situation. I gotta ask then, why would you, in following, you know, in the scope of that, why would you return this object with no properties? Why, why would I return, return null? Why would I return the object with no properties? Keep in mind, I might be querying 20 computers, and I want some way of knowing which ones failed. And I need to output something. Just take the room apart, man, that's fine. <laughs> you know they just remodeled. Just remodeled. Um, I want some way of being able to track which ones failed. I might want to group those off differently at the end of the pipeline and write them to a, a text file so that I could try them again later. This gives me output for the failed computers so I can do something with it. Don't know what that is, not trying to predict it, but it means I'm not losing information. For every object in, I get an object out. I will not still see an error message. Nope. Nope. If you are trapping an exception, if you are catching an exception, then there is no exception, so there is no error message. I would have to throw an error, either by using the throw keyword, or if you're a PowerShell guy, write error, because that's actually where we put errors. I could choose, while we're on the subject, <laughs> you know the problem is that I can't tell my good jokes anymore because everybody knows what the punchline is. Um, <laughs> there are legitimate reasons to use right host and we will cover some of them later. This is not a legitimate reason. But this is something I see people do a lot. Right host is very discoverable. Freaking everybody on the intertubes uses it for stuff. Here's the number one gotcha with it. If I just run this as is on my local computer, the fact that I've used right host will achieve my goal, right? It will, it will do the thing I wanted it to do. I will get text on the screen telling me that it failed to connect to a computer, right? Sure. A, that text is going to show up right in the middle of my output, which is a little vexing, just visually. B, and this is important, I'm going to someday want to push this out via remoting to another computer. And that computer is going to run this, and when it hits that right host, that computer is going to try and put that message on that computer's screen, which I can't see, and there is no way for that host output to come back to me. So I will, this is incompatible with PowerShell patterns because it does not support remoting. Everything is supposed to support remoting, for the most part, all you have to do is not be dumb and PowerShell will do it for you. This is dumb. So what we need to do instead is change that to a right verbose, perhaps a right warning. Neither of those will interrupt the thing and make it quit working. Right error will. Right error will stop it. So use verbose, use warning, whichever you feel is appropriate for you. However, the verbose pipeline, let's go with verbose so we can make a point. The verbose pipeline is off by default. Normally, I will not see verbose output. How would I turn that on? What I need to do is enable the square bracket, yep. That commandlet binding tells PowerShell that I want to get all of the common parameters, including minus verbose. I can now run my script. Let's save this with a different file name. Is that your special version control? Is this my special version control? This is so I can zip them up and give them to you. 
I don't use version control. Version control is, is for people who make mistakes. <laughs> As I do not work in a production environment, I do not make mistakes. So with get OS info 2, I can hit minus V and I have a verbose parameter built in. That will turn on the verbose pipeline for me. That is the that is one of the five or in version 5.6 pipelines, right? You've got output error warning verbose debug and then in version 5 you've got information. And the remoting system knows how to capture those pipelines and bring them back to you. So we're staying within the patterns of what PowerShell does. No right hosting. There is a legit use for right host, and we'll get there, but it's never in a tool. Doing in the catch block, uh, dollar underscore that almost read the error without terminating, and, but I'll also do the rest of the catch block. If you're in the, the catch block, you want to, yeah, so A, don't rely on dollar sign underscore to do that, because that can get usurped by a lot of things. And if you go in and maintain your code and you forget that you use that and you do something that resets it, you break your code. Use dollar sign error square bracket zero to get the most recent error from the error collection. Um, but if you want to stick that inside of a right verbose so that you can actually see the error message, that's fine. Uh, and there's a lot of legit reasons to do that. Um, dollar, dollar underscore is almost always not the greatest thing to use. Well, but dollar, uh, dollar sign underscore itself is the object, and it can get usurped by a lot of different things. So go after it through the error record. So we have a, a, an ebook on PowerShell.org. You guys know the resources menu has an ebooks thing. We have a bunch of free ebooks. One of them is the big book of PowerShell error handling, which in fact is not big. Um, it was meant to be ironic. And it covers the best way to actually get at the errors. And, and it funny. There is no one right way because it kind of depends on the exception you're dealing with at the time. So it kind of walks you through the process. But go back to the command with binding. Once you do that, shouldn't you also then start handling all the other common parameters that you use? Ah, so once I've put commandlet binding up, shouldn't I handle all the other common parameters? The beauty of it is I don't have to. Um, I get minus verbose for free. And if I'm using verbose, it'll work. I get, um, I get minus minus, 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 minus debug for free. Now, I'm not providing any debugging functionality, but you'll find that most commandlets don't. Yeah. Um, pretty much everything else is, is external functionality, like out variable and, and stuff like that. The shell just handles it for you. The what if you have to put in. Ah, so let's talk about that, since you mentioned the what if. And is that what you were thinking? Yeah. <coughs> this does not turn on what if or confirm. Just that does not turn on what, if, or confirm. I have to do this. Two things. Number one, having done that, my commands help will now show minus what, if, and minus confirm. I have not implemented that anywhere. So we'll talk about that as step one. Step two, my command isn't changing the system state. It's a get command. Get commands don't change the system state. They don't delete files. They don't make any modifications. You should not be supporting what if and confirm if you're not making modifications. That's what they're for. So step, that's the second thing. I should not have this in here because my command does not need it. It does not fit within the pattern. I'm not changing anything. However, getting back to the first thing. Let's assume that I have some commands in here that are trying to change stuff. Do I need to do anything special to provide support for minus what if or minus confirm? The answer is maybe. Because by enabling this on my command, when someone runs my command with, let's say, minus what if, that's going to pass through to all the other commands I run inside my script. So if I've tested them and they're already providing adequate support, I don't have to do anything different. However, there will be times when you want to do something that does not involve running a command. Maybe you're firing off a method of a .NET object. Well, they don't have what if and confirm. And so yes, in that case, I would need to manually implement what if and confirm. And we'll look at how to do that later. We'll write a command that modifies the system state uh, in that fashion. But right now we're taking this out of here because it shouldn't be here. I invariably will look at scripts 
that have supports should process and I will look at that script and they have not implemented that support and or their script isn't actually making any changes and I know that that person found that on Google and they don't know why it's there. But it works, so they leave it there. It only needs to be there if you actually need what if and confirm. Say again? Or they used a template. I don't use templates. Real men type, also real women. Any more questions on this, where we are? He's having trouble swallowing that, but. I was just wondering what you said when you add that, it implies the what if, you know, through the rest of it. Can you do that with verbose without adding the verbose switch? Can you just make that right verbose, like apply so, to get him in since verbose? Um, it does. So yeah, it, it, all the common parameters become implied for every command you run. What's that? Not functions. Not functions, commands, commandlets, to be more precise. So if I were to run this now, uh, let's just save it real quick. I'll run it with minus verbose. I got a lot of verbose output that I didn't code because it fell through to my two get sim instance commands, which are incidentally not well written. Do you look at the output? Operation, mm, nothing, complete. Whoops. So you could just explicitly turn that off on those particular commands? I could explicitly turn that off, yeah. I could come in here and put a minus verbose colon false to shut that off if I wanted to. Uh, and I've done that in cases where I didn't like what they were producing and it was getting in the way. Yeah. Yep. Would I normally remove that session once I'm done? Ah, uh, maybe, not usually. Because once it gets back up to the top of this loop and I, I take that object out of context by assigning a new session to the same variable, the old object goes away and that session is closed. It's part of the destruction of the object. So the underlying .NET framework is told destroy this. And the way that object is, is coded internally, it shuts the session down. Uh, and then again, when I when my script finishes and dollar sign session goes out of scope, that destructor is called implicitly. I've tested that, so I know that's the case. If this was, say, a SQL Server connection, yeah, you bet I would explicitly close the connection because I have had words with DBAs about not doing that. Is that weird because the ISC is so different? What's that? So if I were to run and hit play on the ISC, yeah, then sure. that doesn't no, that that wouldn't change. No, it's called right away. The PS sessions are the same? Uh, PS sessions are the same, yes. Yeah, they're actually nearly the same thing. They both inherit from the same underlying object because they're both using WS man and everything under the hood. Just as a general best practice, should you do it just because certain things that you build sessions to, like I've done this to UCS, will essentially get a limit of 50 and yeah, it's hard to it's, if you want to approach life with I'm starting a session, I'm always going to explicitly close it, no one's ever going to make fun of you for that. Good? Excellent. Okay. Why, uh, why have I gone through all this trouble to produce an object as my output? In other words, why haven't I... Why haven't I just done something like this? You know, OS equals get sim instance, computer name, whatever, uh, class name, Win32, just whatever. And then for my output, I'm going to say write output, um, write output, um, you know, name, and then we'll put a control T tab, and then a status, uh, and then, you know, write output, because you, you got to. You have to do that so it looks pretty and, and, and that. And why am I, why am I, why is this bad? Because that's ridiculous. It's <laughs> and they're individual objects, right? But you will see folks who come from other systems, particularly Linux, which is a very text file folder based shell. In Linux, this would not be wrong. But if you're writing a bash script or a Perl script, this is the way you do it. And that's why everything in Linux comes down to grepsidoc and text parsing, 
because everything in the shell is text. PowerShell isn't Linux. It's not better, it's not worse. Apparently we have Bash on Windows now for reasons that are not entirely clear to me, but whatever. It, it, it just, it's PowerShell's different. Windows is not a text-based operating system. One of the reasons command.exe has been so problematic for automation is because it's putting a text interface on top of an intrinsically API and object-based operating system. PowerShell is object-based. I could not take this output and pipe it to export CSV. Export CSV wouldn't have the slightest clue what to do with it. I could not pipe it to convert to HTML. I could not pipe it to format anything because I've pre-formatted it all. So that's why this is the wrong approach and it's why, doo -doo -doo, it's why this is the right approach. Object-based output, one kind of object in the pipeline at a time. And if your goal is, I want to make sure I can capture the names of the computers that don't work, then you have to take this type of approach where you're outputting a failure object that looks just like the rest of them and can be differentiated in some fashion from the successful ones. Good. Um, the other thing that we will sometimes see people do This is a terrible idea. This breaks everything. Right, that right there, little known fact, that there is why Krypton exploded. <laughs> it's true. Because format table does not produce objects. It produces formatting directives that the shell is, is intending to use to build the screen. And what's gonna happen is, it's going to output a set of headers, and then a data row, and then what's technically a set of footer objects. And then it's gonna loop back up and get the next computer name and output a set of headers and one data row and a set of footers and the shell is going to get that and go no absolutely not never in a tool never format your code never format your output something else you'll notice um, and I, I, I don't know if you notice you can kind of see over on the left hand side the the output list right you can see the property names they're not in the right order as of PowerShell 3, I could have created an ordered hash table here instead of just a regular hash table. And then my properties would have come out in the order I set them here, and I don't care. Here's why I don't care. One, I just, I'm apathetic about that sort of thing. I just don't care. Two, what the shell is using is a more memory efficient hash table than an ordered one. So I'm being less impactful on the system. If I get into a situation where I care about the output, I will tell it what order I want them in. That's what select object is for, or format list, or format table. Because as, as far as I know to begin with, Remember, I don't know where this output's gonna go. If somebody cares about the order, well then they can specify it. I don't want my tool making any assumptions about how the data is going to be consumed next. Is there any problem with doing select within the object that you're returning? Is there a problem doing select within the object you're returning? Yeah, you're making a decision and an extra computing point where there shouldn't be a decision or a computing point. So let's, let's talk about the two classes of scripts because this is where we're really starting to draw a line now. Um, first of all, do you guys know where, so I, I kind of started popularizing the word tool making in the PowerShell world. You know where I, I got it? Have I told you this story? Woodshop. Wood, not Woodshop, really close though. Um, my first job out of high school was as an F-14 aircraft engineering mechanic apprentice. So I went through a four year apprenticeship uh, and we learned how to take F-14s apart and put them back together again. So if you ever buy a used F-14 on eBay, call me. Um, I actually have the F-14 Tomcat tattooed on my leg. And as part of my apprenticeship, we had to rotate through all the different shops that we had. Uh, you know, we had an electrical shop and this shop and that shop, and we had a machine shop. Because we were, we were set up, I was a Navy employee, a civilian employee of the Navy, we were set up to deal with battle-damaged aircraft 
And sometimes you had to be able to make your own parts. So we had an extensive machine shop. So I had to do a two week ro rotation through the machine shop and it convinced me that I never want to be a machinist ever. What a filthy, disgusting, shrapnel filled profession. And this is coming from a guy who took more than one or two baths in jet fuel, okay? And I'm calling that dirty. That's where it sits on my, my, my ranking. And there were two types of people in the machine shop. You had the machinists who were out on the, the shop floor, sitting there staring all day at a machine, take three hours to cut one swath of metal off. And that's what they, that was the job. I'm like this is the least intellectually stimulating thing I have ever done. Uh, and I have watched paint dry because that was a different shop. <laughs> and it was hot and cold, depending on the time of year. And you know, this was Virginia, so it was humid as anything you can imagine. And all there's just little bits of metal and oil flying everywhere that stick to you, just gross. Did not want to be a machinist. The, the bits, the drill bits that go into the machine that actually cut the swaths, they're not called drill bits, they're called tools. And off to the side of the shop, in a room with glass windows and doors and sweet, sweet air conditioning, <laughs> sitting in very business casual clothing in front of a computer running CAD CAM software were the tool makers, the ones who made the tools. They designed them and, and they would be made and then they would go out onto the shop floor to the nastiness. And I decided that if, if I had offended God and was going to be put into this trade, I wanted to be a tool maker, not a tool user. And so that's why I call this tool making, because ideally, you get to a world where somebody calls you with a problem and you're like, be right back, typey, 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 type, 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 here. What do I do with this? Run it. You didn't fix the problem? This will fix the problem all times from now on. Don't ever call me again, just run that. I'd rather be a tool maker. So that's where that came from. And so let's talk about the difference between the two types of PowerShell scripts that you're going to, to write in your career. One type is a tool and the other type is a controller. And the purpose of a tool is to do one thing, to do it well, and to honestly be written with very little context about where it will eventually live. It does not know what is creating its input. All of its input comes to it through its parameters. It has no idea if my computer names are coming from a database or a text file or if they're being manually typed or if they're going to come flying in out of Active Directory. It doesn't know and it doesn't care. Just give me computer names and I'll do my thing. And its output lacks as much context as possible. Here's an object. I'm putting it at the pipeline. I have no idea what you're going to do with it after that. I don't care and I'm not going to make a lot of decisions about it. I'm just going to give it to you and the next thing can deal with it. A tool should do one thing, get. Here, here's a really good example of what I kind of mostly abhor. Now I've put myself in a situation where I have to check and see if the person provided a file name. And if they did provide a file name, I'm going to go open that file up and read computer names. And if they didn't, hopefully they provided computer names. This is, t I'm doing two things here. We already have commands that know how to open files. So we should just have been using those. This command should not be trying to do two things. It should be getting operating system information or whatever it's doing and just that. It's not going to change anything. That would be a separate command. Because my verb here is get. Get focuses me in on just one thing. Always use the approved verbs. You know, you can run get verb to see a list of approved verbs. What happens if you use an unapproved verb? You go to hell. You do get a warning if you're importing a module that uses unapproved verbs. But you really do break the consistency of the shell. That's what we're here for is consistency. Um, it, there's, there's, no, there's no approval for aliases. So you can do whatever wacky, crazy thing you want to do with your aliases. Tools do one thing and they do them well. So if my job was, we need you to, to automate the creation of new user accounts. 
and that in, that includes you know setting up their home directory, their Active Directory account, their Exchange mailbox. There's a bunch of different stuff that 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 involves, right? But user provisioning, that's not one tool. That's a bunch of tools, and a controller script is what takes those tools and gives them context and purpose. The controller script is what might prompt someone for the new employee information, or the controller script is what might go to the PeopleSoft database and grab the new employee information, and it will then run the tool that creates a new user, and run the tool that creates the home directory, and run the tool that shares that, and run the tool that does whatever other wacky things have to happen. And that controller script looks a lot more like a batch file. It should be really simple, have a really minimal amount of logic, and it's not going to be a function. It's just going to be a script because it's controlling a business process. Tools don't know why they're being run. Controller scripts are the why. And if you can create that division of labor, think about how much easier it is to debug and test that 82 step controller script when all 82 steps are actually just a single standalone unit that can be tested by itself. And further on down the line when the company says, yeah, we've got this new system now and, and provisioning has to take care of that too. Great. I'll write one more tool and I'll slap it into the controller and Bob's your uncle. Creates better maintainability over the long haul, much better modularization and it fits the patterns of PowerShell. It works with the shell the way it wants to be worked with. Good so far? Jiggle your heads. Okay. All right. Well, we're not quite done. We need to do a little bit more fun with this parameter dude up here. Parameter. Let's make him mandatory. Value from pipeline equals true. True. Value from pipeline. Pipeline by property name equals. That's a lot to type. Um, help message. Ooh, ah, crap. <laughs> All right, well, I don't know how to get back. <laughs> no. No. Oh, all right. Um, that's good. That's a lot. Um, do I prefer help messages this way or in comment-based help? Yes. I like both. And I will teach you why I like both. You will learn. Um, alias is fun. Because I've hooked this up to do pipeline binding by property name, my script will accept an incoming object that has a computer name property. No object actually has a computer name property. Right? You go to get AD computer, it's got a name property, or maybe a, a CN, or you know, FQDN, whatever, whatever you choose to grab. But it's not computer name. Um, so, for that matter, I could do this. That alias allows me to hook up non-standard, inconsistent parameter names to facilitate pipeline parameter binding. So if I know that one of the uses for this is going to be accepting an object that has a host name property, I can go ahead and create a specific handler for that without actually having to put a bunch of code in place. The shell will just figure this out and make it work. Make sense? Um, so the help message, let's talk about him. If I run my little script, get OS info, not typing any parameter names, what should it do when I hit enter? It should prompt me because I've coded that as mandatory. Look at the third line there, the last line before the prompt. That's where help message gets used. And that's why I use that in addition to comment-based help, which we'll get to in a bit. And anybody not use comment-based help? Good, that was a trick question we would have asked you to leave. Okay, uh, should we test the pipeline stuff? Make sure it works? You're a very trusting group. Do you have a DC where you can pipe computers in from 
I, I do have a DC. It's named DC. I, just, I remember there was a bug where piping things in that the, the command or the property binding didn't seem to work with the aliases. So like even though you had computer name piping in by property name with name from the object, I could never get the oh, piping. Oh, the where the, um, there are bugs in different versions of PowerShell about aliases not working for, for property names. Yeah, so I always had to name my computer name name, which I hated, and then give it an alias of computer name. Yeah, so... If I if I had to make a decision, here's here's what I would do. Um, first of all, let me let's see. DC equals new PS session computer name DC. Yep. Import module. Just a sec. Uh, PS, PS session session name active directory. Oh darn it! Because I call it DC. Yay. Okay, so his point, and this is where we'll repeat the question, is if I get all my AD computers, they have a name property. Now, I have not hooked up a name alias here, but his question was, in many occasions, even where I were, if I were to put a name alias, there are, there are some bug situations where it will not pick that up for pipeline parameter binding. And so he said, so what I wind up doing instead is I wind up calling this parameter itself name just to make sure it will be able to pipeline bind name coming out of that command. Um, that's a choice. I choose not to. I choose, I choose the path of consistency. And in that case, what I would do is this. Sorry, I got that backwards. Be right with you. You would take that over the convenience of letting the end user just pipe get AD computer into your tool? I would take this over the convenience, yes, because I don't actually expect the end user to be doing this all that often. I would probably be giving them a controller script anyway that wrapped that specific task up for them. Or, and I'll show you an example of one a little bit later. Yeah, I tend to err on the side of consistency and maintainability. And let me, let me tell you a little story about why. I like stories. we have time for a story? Sure we do. Um, how many of you still map network drives? Yep. We've been mapping network drives since forever, right? Netware mapped network drives. How many of you have login scripts that do that? How many of you do it with GPP? Why did it take so long for Microsoft to put mapped drives into group policy? There's an answer. They had to buy a company to do it. They did. You know, do you know why? There's actually a reason why it took them. They have a complete corporate blind spot around mapped drives. Because they came to a point in their, their, their organizational history where they said, these things are stupid. They're not sustainable. Like there's only 26, and by default you lose like you know three or four or whatever else. And they're not memorable, and so internally they stood up a DFS tree and told their users, "Map drives are going away. You can go to whack whack Microsoft root whack sales. Whack, just here's your UNCs." And a bunch of their users said, and I'm sure this is exactly how many of you've proposed that. And how many of you were told, no, we'll never be able to remember that. It'll be too hard. And Microsoft said, well, then you'll have to get a job somewhere else. <laughs> because this is what's happening. And you're going to be able to learn it. And you just are. And you still have to get your job done. And you're not allowed to use this as an excuse for not getting your job done. We'll just have to let you go. And miracle of miracles, no one lost their job. Funniest thing in the world. So if I have to choose between consistency and maintainability and following the right patterns versus letting someone be lazy, screw them. Do your job. But I'm also an engineer and I like empathy. I say, I think if you were my, my next layer up and then you went and told the rest of the team that, I'd be able to pull that off. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, it goes back to your original where it's like, I need you to change computer, oh, not the computer name, the other Yep, I would just steadfastly refuse. Nope, uh-uh, not going to do it. Why are you lazy? Turn it around, man. Make it their fault. I am going to write it down for you on a piece of paper, and we'll tape it to your cube. Security wouldn't like that. Screw them. <laughs> I have met very few security people that actually know anything about computers, so I can usually run my way around that, too.
as my company tries desperately to build out a large infosec library. <sighs> Good times. Okay. Uh, we've got some right verbose action going on in here. Look, is, June's not in here. Good. I'm not going to do the comment-based help. <laughs> and don't tell her. Don't tell her. Look, the only reason I'm not putting comment-based help is, is because I know you guys know what it is. If you don't know what it is, look it up. It's very straightforward. I just want to save some room on the screen here right now. That's it. That's all I'm after. However, if I did do comment-based help, I would put it at the top right there. Okay. Help is your most important feature. Help is not my most important feature. It's the second most important feature. Shipping is the most important feature. Um, no, I, in, in a production script, I absolutely always use comment-based help. I do it every time. I often write my comment-based help first because it serves as my functional specification for what I think I want this thing to look like. And then I go and code it up and make sure it matches. Um, it is very important, but I want to save space. Here's something that almost nobody does that I wish everybody does. Oops. My uh, command here does not in fact require the Active Directory module, but this is an example. Uh, I do see a lot of folks who will hand code a lot of code to see if the module is available, see if the module is loaded. You don't need to do any of that. If you depend on a module, this is the right way to document it. This is the second right way to document it. There's another way that we'll come to in a moment that's actually better. Um, but this is, this, is, this is a good declarative way of saying I need these things as minimums. Um, I screw this one up all the time. Is it just administrator? It's, it's run as, yeah. That, oh, yep. I didn't realize I put a space in there. That's good. If something has to be administrator, put that in there. Don't, don't fool people about it. Because you know when you open up a new shell instance, it, unless you've dorked with your shortcuts, it's not admin by default, which might be good. I mean, that might be what, what works for your environment. But if this needs to be administrative, then... Now, in my case, does my code need to be run as an administrator in order for it to work? Probably it does. Probably it does. By default, your remote sim will only accept members of the local administrators group as well as members of the remote management group. The underlying WMI repository, which is the sim repository is the same as the, they're the same thing. Only administrators are allowed to query that thing remotely. That's the default permission. And you really don't want to dork with that permission because A, there's almost no way to automate it and B, you'll break everything. I mean everything. Anybody use System Center? You will totally break System Center. Completely. So, so I, I probably would leave that in there. Let's pull it up for right now. <coughs> Just for fun. Um, what else? Uh, what uh, else? Uh, yeah. Yep. administrator, they didn't come until uh, version three. Yeah, run as administrator we picked up in version three, yeah. Okay. Yeah, requires uh, also picked up module in version two. And then it was only version in version one, which was kind of pointless. I know it doesn't exist, but have you seen a way, so when you're developing, to make sure, say you're developing a version five, you want to make sure you don't use anything that's unique to version five ah. and deploy yeah. three. Yeah, no. So here's, here's the question. Um, and this is a really good question, and it's something the team needs to wrap their head around. Um, Let's say I've got version five on my computer here, and I know I'm gonna to plan to deploy this script to machines that are running versions three, four, and five. Is there a way to make sure I'm not doing something that's unique to five and just not realizing it? Uh, and the answer is statically today, using the native stuff, no. Now, what, what you're essentially asking for, and, and the right thing would be in Visual Studio, you can target a specific version of the framework and it's got libraries that tell it this is in version 2 and this is in 3. And if you try to use something that's off version, it'll squiggle it for you. We don't have that native tooling, no. Yeah? Can't you run the, can't you run the, the engine under a certain version? 
you can run the engine under a, a different version, but that won't. There's there's no programmatic way for it to tell you that you've you've done things that are off version. Some things, yes. Certain engine-based language things, yes. But it doesn't know, for example, what the remoting stack looks like or whether certain commands are out there. So it's not complete. But but so in your idea of ISC is just for development, test everything in the test everything in the console. In the console. Couldn't you then run the console under a specific version, and when you do your testing, it would flag yeah, well, that you're out of version? Uh, well, it wouldn't flag it. It would error. Right, but that, but now you know, hey, I can't do that now because that's... Yes and no. There's there's no static declarative way, which is what he's after. There's try running it in whatever ver I mean, I could also just run it on a computer that had the version, sure. which is actually safer because that whole engine switch is is not like a complete running of that engine. Uh, it's it, I've seen instances where things would work there, but then if you took them to an actual machine, they would fail. Right. So it's not tight. I'm to play Oops, sorry. With Fight it out. I'm starting to play with Pester and Script Analyzer. Is there any way in those tools to simulate that? Um, Pester and neither Pester nor Script Analyzer will simulate another version. You could certainly set up Analyzer static rules, but you would have to know to look for everything. Right, like you could set up a rule that looked for the minus in operator, which uh, didn't exist in version two. We only had minus contains, but you'd have to set that up, and it would just be a static analysis, and it's still not going to ever be like a hundred million percent, especially as the language itself gets bigger and more complicated. So, at that point, but he's he's first. Yeah, PowerShell dash version only supports the 2.0 engine, correct. You can't, you can't force it to drop to 3 or 4 now. Uh, and that's because of the way those engines install. 2 was the only one they did a side-by-side -side with. Yeah. At that point, you need to test on the same with Pester. Put it in a continuous delivery tool that will do that testing for you. Version 2, version 3, version 4. We yeah. test, I get the resource back. Well, yeah. So, I mean, the idea is if you're doing a build pipeline with, with Pester, you would spin up a VM that has version 2 and one that has version 3 and one that has version 4 and see if your code explodes. And, and all you're doing is automating the same thing we were talking about. Run it and see if it explodes. Um, Pester certainly makes that a little easier. You know, if you've got a good build pipeline like Team City or something that can spin up stuff. In fact, the reason that the PowerShell.org build service which is a free build server we offer to open source community projects that you didn't know about that? I didn't know that. Yeah, we don't have really good marketing department. <laughs> uh, it's on the resources menu, so you know, browse around now and again. Um, the reason we use TeamCity instead of the Azure based pipeline that the PowerShell Gallery offers is because the PowerShell Gallery only uses four and Pester works all the way back to two. And so we wanted to be able to target version two, version three, version four. So that's why we're using Team City to do that. Uh, and the, that, yeah, that's the only way to do it is to just try it and see if it explodes. All good questions. What else? What else do you want to do to this? Oh, we didn't actually test it. I knew there was something else. DC, win81, get OS info. Well, that half worked. Ah. So let's talk about how the command lives. When you run a command declaratively just by itself and you're giving it parameters, it runs from top to bottom. So if I give it 10 computer names, when my command runs, when it hits line one, all 10 computer names are in that computer name parameter variable, right? And it just runs from top to bottom. And that's why I have a for each in here. So I can enumerate through those 10 and do them one at a time. But remember what I told you about the pipeline. The pipeline is this kind of pseudo multi-thread thing where only one object speeds through the pipeline at a time. So when I run this in the pipeline, like I did here, PowerShell looks for a begin block, a process block, and an end block. Do, 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 tap. The begin block runs first. And that happens before pipeline parameter binding occurs. So your pipeline bound variables will be empty at that point. 
any explicitly typed variables, like that the person actually typed out on the, the keyboard, those will be populated in the begin block. And then the process block runs, and your pipeline variable gets one object, which means my for each is redundant in that mode. And that's fine. It doesn't hurt it to be there. It's going to enumerate the one object the one time. The for each is there to support a different run scenario. My process block will run completely from top to bottom for each input object. So if you pipe in 10 things, it's going to run 10 times. And then the end block will run. I see a lot of folks get really upset and confused because they've targeted pipeline parameter binding in their parameter block with those two value from pipeline and value from pipeline by, param or by property name, but they haven't put in a process block. And when that happens, you wind up only getting the last object out. So let's save that and try again. There we go. The for, each, the for each loop is redundant because it's only enumerating one thing, but it's perfectly happy to only enumerate one thing. Internally, like if, if you go disassemble a lot of the, the native PowerShell commands, like if you decompile them into C sharp, they look exactly like that. They do the same because that's how you have to do it. I will see folks go through this big logical, all right, I need to see if this was bound and if I'm in parameter mode or if I'm in pipeline mode and I'll take, no, you don't need to do any of that. Well, yeah, but you have this redundant for each and no one cares. It doesn't cost me anything. Well, this is easier also to just test it out here. And you, and you have to have it to support the other scenario. You can't, just, because when I run this not in the pipeline, when there's no pipeline input, it ignores begin process and end and just runs straight top to bottom. So whatever's in the begin block will run because I have it in that position, but it just sort of implicitly ignores the fact that the begin, the process, and the end keywords are there. It just what, what other scenario would have been on the parameter computer name? You just say yep. like comma computer, comma computer, computer. Yep. Oop, crap. So if the for each loop wasn't there, that would not work. That's the other per that needs the for each. And this, that needs the for each. And that is why we support both scenarios. We don't just lock it down to pipeline input because there's times when getting the pipeline input to work is going to be more pain than it's worth. And that is an easier workaround. That is not as performant. Right? Let's, how, many, how many computers do you have in Active Directory? More than two? Right, so in this scenario, I'm forcing the shell to go query all the computers and then remember all of their names in its memory and then dump all of those into that computer name variable in one go where I'm going to enumerate through them again. I'm wasting processing power and memory. But sometimes that's the only scenario that works. So we support it. Yeah, what? Said hit enter. Hit enter. Oh, uh, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, th so to, to do that kind of exact same thing, get AD computer, filter star, select expand name, right? What's in the pipeline at this point are just string objects. that will perform better. Because now it's going to run in the pipeline. It's going to run my begin block, which is empty. And the process block will execute once. And it'll be able to stream those things in as they come in from Active Directory. And actually, what's fun, you can't do it with a, a script commandlet. In version 4 of PowerShell, there is a way for a native commandlet. There's a way for a native commandlet to send a stop signal back up the pipeline. For example,
Active Directory is going to start sending computer names over. I'm going to start processing them. Select really only wants the first four. So if select after it gets four can send a, we're done, up the pipeline. And every command that is capable of responding to that will stop processing so things can wrap up a little quicker. Why, why would I not put that? You should, ideally. Um, it turns out get AD computer does not respond to the stop signal, so it doesn't matter where I put it. <laughs> My function will. Functions will respond to that because the shell itself knows how. Um, and in this case, a script, because we're not even up to a function yet. Is there any way from inside a script to know what's in the pipeline? No, because you only have one. You have no idea what, what else is coming. You would have to accumulate them all and then you wouldn't know until the end. And you'd be blocking the pipeline while you did that. So things like progress bars. Yeah, well, progress bars kind of are what they are. Um, that's why you don't see a lot of progress bars in PowerShell because it's not often known in advance what 100% looks like. So, yeah. Can I take a break? Yeah. I think we have snacky bits outside. So let's take a 15-minute break. We'll come back at 1045.